June 26, 2000 is a historic day in American history because on this day, President Clinton stood side by side with J. Craig Venter and Francis Collins to announce the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. What we learned from the Human Genome Project was this. The genome actually had far fewer genes than were anticipated, but the variation of the genes was far greater than anyone expected, with over three million variations. Our phenotype, what we express, how we look, for example, results from an interaction of our genes and our environment. This interaction occurs through what is called the epigenome. I like to think about it this way. We all have 23 chromosomes. They're in pairs. One member of each pair comes from dad, and one comes from mom. I like to think of this as our 23 chapters in our book of life, because what we express and who we are depends on what chapter we read. Let me explain this. If my arm is DNA, my genetic material, the sleeve that washes over my arm is the epigenome. Epi means above. So basically what I'm saying is the epigenome washes over the genes and the epigenome is influenced by how we live our lives, the food we eat, the stress levels that we have, the nutrients that we take. So let me give you another visual. If the gene is my arm and the epigenome is what washes over my genes, I like to think about drops of rain falling down on the epigenome, but those drops of rain are really information. And that information is coming from things like our nutrients, which then go and influence the epigenome, resulting in certain genes being turned on and certain genes being turned off. So what this means is that our epigenome is really a personal history of our life from conception to death. And the composition of this epigenome is a result of our genetic determinants, our lineage, and as we just said, our environment. According to Randy Jertle, an authority on the epigenome, certain genes appear more what is described as epigenetically sensitive than others. It is clear in the fetus that these genes are capable of being environmentally marked. Let me give you another example. Researchers have a mouse called the agouti mouse. The agouti mouse is yellow, it's fat, and it has a high risk of cancer, diabetes, and obesity. It has a reduction in its lifespan. So this mouse is used in research to study these diseases. If we take a pregnant agouti mouse and we give the mom nutrients like zinc and the B vitamins, folate and B12, the mom produces a completely normal offspring. The baby is thin, is brown, and has no risk or a much lower risk of cancer, diabetes, and obesity. And the baby mouse lives a long life. 
This has profound implications. So let's just stop and think about this for a second. A pregnant mouse is being given nutrients and the nutrients that mom eats affects the baby mouse developing cancer, diabetes, and obesity. What we're saying here is not only what we do affects our own epigenome, but what we do also affects the next generation. The nutrient signature imprints our cells with information. What that is saying is that when a mom eats during pregnancy, she is imprinting the fetus with information which are now called epigenetic tags. We now know that there are many conditions that are associated with these epigenetic tags. These include things that we see every day in healthcare, like type 2 diabetes, heart disease. We also see these epigenetic tags involved in autoimmune disease, in Alzheimer's disease, allergies, and even in some cancers. All of these major medical conditions can be influenced by environmental factors. Our chances of developing any or all of these conditions can be increased or decreased by how we live our lives. In other words, what I am saying is, your genes are not your destiny. You are more than your genes. We already know that a number of vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals, which are chemicals that come from plants, have been shown to affect the epigenome. We saw in the baby mouse that when the baby received the B vitamins, the mouse came out normal. What else do we know about these vitamins and nutrients? Things like niacin, zinc, iron, riboflavin, even resveratrol, which comes in dark red grapes, can affect the epigenome. So what this translates into is food is really information. The Journal of Clinical Nutrition reported that diet-induced changes in the epigenome during pregnancy and early development may increase the risk of the metabolic syndrome, which is a condition associated with diabetes. Imagine, diet-induced changes during pregnancy or early development can predict risk of a disease maybe 20 or 35 years later. And as we said, even can predict risk in the next generation. This is so important that I just want to review one piece again. We take in nutrients all day long. The food that we eat is metabolized and it is absorbed by our small intestine. Eventually, it gets into our bloodstream. It's broken down and goes into our bloodstream and enters the cells of our body. So our cells are not seeing a ham sandwich, but our cells are seeing the breakdown products of whatever we ate. So our cells are seeing things like folate, for example, if we ate lots of green leafy vegetables. These nutrients, like those drops of rain, sit on top of the epigenome and tell the epigenome, turn this gene on or that gene off. When we turn a gene on or a gene off, we express different kinds of proteins. Now, 
Let's take a look at the research that highlights this interaction between our genes and our environment. The most obvious one to talk about is twins, genetically identical twins. When we see them, we can't even separate them apart. Usually only mom or dad knows which one is which. But we know that when the twins grow up, they don't always have the same diseases in midlife. One may have cancer, for example, and the other may not. I have a dear friend who's a genetically identical twin, and her sister had a heart attack at the age of 36. This sent my friend into an uproar because she thought she was next. But I explained to her, I said, your sister was smoking three packs of cigarettes every day. You need to do everything you can do to place your genes in a different environment because research is showing us that the epigenome is involved. In the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2008, a study was published that looked at a gene called the FTO, F, T is in Tom, O, obesity gene. And they studied a population that has this genetic variant to be obese. They studied the Amish people. But when they evaluated the community, they weren't obese. And what they concluded was that the members of the Amish community were walking over 18,000 steps a day. The obesity gene in this case was trumped by physical activity. That's pretty profound because if something like physical activity could almost silence a gene that's predisposing us to something like diabetes or obesity, then that exercise becomes very powerful medicine. Let me share another study with you. Dr. Dean Ornish has done a lot of research in heart disease, but he decided to apply similar principles to men with low-grade prostate cancer. And what he did was he taught men how to eat a very low-fat, plant-based, whole foods diet. So he changed their entire diet. He put them in stress management classes where they learned yoga and meditation. He got them exercising, and he put them in social support groups to help deal with stress. And he did this for just three months. The men were biopsied before, and they were biopsied again after the three-month lifestyle intervention. And what they found was amazing. Biopsies after the intervention showed that over 400 genes associated with prostate cancer were turned off. This is only a three-month intervention to turn off prostate cancer genes. Again, this is very powerful medicine. And some of the most fascinating studies are coming out in the arena of stress. Numerous studies have shown that there are incredibly strong links between chronic stress and poor health. Stress is a recognized risk factor for a number of diseases, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, and the list goes on. Telomeres are DNA proteins that are essential to cell division. Our cells are dividing all the time. We change our full body every seven years or so. We don't have the same cells we were born with. Without telomeres, we would not be able to make new cells. 
and obviously we would die. Telomerase is the enzyme involved in this crucial mechanism. In a study conducted by Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, she evaluated the relationship between stress and aging on telomeres and telomerase. I want to mention that Dr. Blackburn received the Nobel Prize for her work. In this one study, she took 58 premenopausal women and she had them fill out questionnaires about stress in their life, how they see the world, how they perceive themselves as stressed. Dr. Blackburn wanted to determine if stress impacts health by affecting the rate of cellular aging. She then went ahead and measured the telomere length and the telomerase enzyme. I like to think about it this way. Imagine you have a shoelace, and at the end of the shoelace is a plastic tip. That plastic tip is your telomere. And over time, the tip could wear down, and it can break down. Well, as the telomere tip breaks down, so do we age. And the more broken down it is, the closer we are to death. Now, what did she find? Those women who had the highest levels of perceived stress had the shortest telomeres. In essence, these high-stress women had a cell age that was 10 years older than their biological age. It was 10 years older than the cell age of the low-stress women. Now, haven't we all seen this? Haven't we said, boy, that person is really aged under stress? This incredible finding, for the first time, begins to unlock the secret to stress and aging. So how else might we use this genetic information for practical purposes? The most profound thing that we talked about up until this point is that nutrients and food and the environment in which we live in can influence the epigenome and ultimately our health. And that, in and of itself, is an amazing story. But a new field is emerging called nutrigenomics. And just like the name sounds, nutrigenomics is studying the relationship between genes and nutrition, genes and the food that we eat. Let me give you an example that we use already in cardiology today. The APO Big E is a type of genotype which is tested routinely in heart patients. We inherit one of these genes from each of our parents. The APO E has three different types, APO E2, APO E3, and ApoE4. Let me stop there for a second. The ApoE3 is the one we see in the majority of people. The ApoE4 predicts the highest risk for heart disease and Alzheimer's disease. And I want us to remember, if you go out and have this blood test tomorrow, if you're an APO E4, please do not run around and say, I'm going to get heart disease or Alzheimer's disease. This is just a predictor of risk. This is not a diagnosis. So how does knowing something about the APO E4, 3, and 2 relate at all to nutrition? Well, most of us are born, as I said, with the E3 variant. However, those individuals with the E2 variant actually do better on a high-fat diet, especially if they have a problem in their blood called high triglycerides. 
and that's a form of fat. Now, individuals with the E4 variant do better with a really low-fat diet, 20% versus 35. Now, as a cardiologist, I have known for years there is not one diet fits all. Everyone is unique and different. But imagine that we now have genetic information that is going to start to tell us what kind of nutrition recommendations that we should make. Nutritionists already in this country are being trained in this area because they're getting ready for what's called the nutrigenomics revolution, which is when we can really start saying to people, based on X, Y, and Z genes, this is how you should eat, these are the supplements you should take, and as you will see in a minute, the drugs you should take or avoid. Which brings us to another area of amazing promise, and that's pharmacogenomics. And as this name implies, this field studies the interaction between medication and genes. And we are already starting to put this information into clinical practice. Let's take a look at how. There's a drug that we commonly use in cardiology called warfarin. Its other name is Coumadin. Coumadin is a blood thinner, and it is metabolized by liver enzymes. When I have to put a patient on Coumadin, I never quite know what dose to give because everyone metabolizes this drug differently. And that's kind of scary because, as I just said, this is a blood thinner. So if I give too much, I can make someone's blood really thin and they can bleed. So it's always been a guessing game for cardiologists. And we usually err on the side of being conservative, where we say, let's start with a slightly lower dose and see how you respond. But we don't have to do that anymore. Depending on an individual's genetic variant, they will be rapid, or slow metabolizers of the drug. A rapid metabolizer obviously needs more. We all have an example of this that we see in our friends and in our family, which is caffeine. Some people can say, give me a triple espresso and I'm going to go to bed. And some of us look at that person and say, how can you go to bed after a triple espresso? Well, that individual is most likely a rapid metabolizer of caffeine. Other individuals might say, I can't even handle one cup of caffeine. It's just too much. So the genetic variants explain more than 50% of the variability in the requirement of Coumadin. And again, as I said before, this is important because if someone is a rapid metabolizer, I can go ahead and give a slightly higher amount but a slow metabolizer, I want to start with a lower and safer dose. I see a lot of women in my cardiology practice, and one question I get quite a bit is, should I be on aspirin? And there are some guidelines for aspirin recommendations that we have. And of course, someone who's had a heart attack or has risk factors for heart disease, like high blood pressure, we would say, yes, you should probably be on an aspirin. But there's now an interesting test called the, now this is big L, big P, B, big A, genotype test. We know that a single protein switch in this gene is associated with a higher risk of cardiac events and coronary artery disease. We got some insight about this gene from a very important study called the Women's Health Initiative. And what they found was this. If you give an aspirin 
to a non-carrier of the LPA variant, someone who doesn't have this little protein switch, it had no effect on reducing cardiovascular events. But in women who carried one copy of this risk variant, those women were at much higher risk for cardiovascular events, almost twice that of non-carriers. Why is it important? Because the women with this genetic variant, if we give them an aspirin, their risk is decreased. So if a woman has this genetic variant, I'm going to say, I want to recommend aspirin. A couple of other questions come up in cardiology. One is, should I take statin therapy? Statins are the drugs that lower cholesterol. And I just want to mention briefly that there is also a genetic test that can tell you whether or not you are prone to have a problem with metabolism of statins. What does that mean? Certain people in the population, when they take a statin, cholesterol-lowering drug, they get muscle aches, joint aches, and pain. And we now have a blood test that we can do to determine if you are at genetic risk for this problem. And obviously, if you are, then we want to try other medications that are not statin therapy. Today we have discussed some of the fascinating research on the human genome. We have explored the new fields of nutrigenomics and pharmacogenomics, and I really believe the big hope that these fields hold for the future. Even more importantly, we have seen that it's possible to turn genes on and off through nutrition and lifestyle change. That's where the science of natural healing comes in. In the rest of this course, you will be given the tools to make nutrition and lifestyle choices that can have positive and profound impact on your genes.